on that. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, today we have with us uh, Soren Johnson. Uh, Soren Johnson is a game designer uh, specializing in Forex and strategy games. Uh, you may not know him some, from some titles as he was this lead designer on CIF4 before starting his own company uh, known as Mohawk Games, where they, they've done offer trading to company and the recently released Old Worlds. So uh, without further ado, Soren, I'll, I'll let you keep going. All right. Um... Hey everybody! Uh, great to see see you all here, and uh, really excited to talk to you about forex game design today. Um, as in Lebanon very recently, I was able to meet a number of you there, which was a really great experience with Layla. Um, and so, um, you know, looking forward to talking about the work I do as a designer. And uh, uh, I'm going to have time for questions. Uh, during the presentation, and then also at the at the end, we can have just kind of an open session for anything you want to bring up about you know even outside of outside of uh, the the topics I kind of cover today. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, today and tomorrow. Today I'm going to kind of stick to just talking about old world and the civilization games. Um, I'm going to talk you know mostly about old world, but also there's going to be a part at the end where I talk about. Um, Developing the AI for civilization and how that's kind of a little different than it is for other other strategy games, um, and you know I imagine that that'll take a little bit over an hour, and so we should probably have probably at least, at least half an hour for general questions at the end. Um, so that's how things are going to work. So I'll just sort of jump jump right into it. Um, so yeah, this is this is the these are the games I've, I've worked on, you know, up to to Old World. Um, I started out with uh, Civilization Three was the first game I worked on in the industry, uh, or the first my first full time job, uh, which was really fortunate for me because I always loved the Civilization series and I've always been really into history. Um, and you know, I went from that to being the lead designer of Civilization Four, uh, which is a title that I'm really proud of and and worked out really well. Uh, after that, uh, I left to join uh, Will Wright's Spore team. Uh, and after that, worked on Dragon Age Legends, which was a Facebook game, um, <laughs> which was a bit of a, a detour to me, but I was interested in trying to get um, kind of a, you know, a, sort of a more gamey role-playing game into that, into that format. Um, and then in 2012, we founded Mohawk Games, um, and our first title was Offworld Trading Company, which is an economic RTS the way to put that is an art is an RTS without any combat. It's just uh, just focuses on the, the macro part of the game, and I'll be talking about off world more uh, tomorrow. Uh, I also host a podcast um, on uh, game design. I've been doing it for well about seven or eight years now. Uh, interview lots of lots of designers about about their work. Um, uh, Layla, Layla sits in on it uh, sometimes um, to, to help out with the interviews, um, and uh, it's a continuing thing. So I would I would recommend it if you uh, if you like podcasts. So what is old world? One second, to screen a little better. Um, so old world is a four X set in classical antiquity with a focus on characters. Uh, the simplest way to describe it is uh, imagine a game that's like Civilization, but you are actually Alexander the Great. So every turn you get a year older and you will eventually die. And then you know, eventually your, your kids will come, will take over. So it's as much about managing a dynasty and a succession uh, as it is about managing a, a nation and, and an empire. This is the very first pitch screen that we did for, that we presented for Old World when we were looking for, for funding. Um, it was a lot simpler uh, at the start. In fact, uh, in this image it was sort of conceived of as a tablet game. Uh, this is when I was starting to get interested in like the iPad. Um, but there was still an order system, which is a really key component of, the, of, of Old World. And there was a resource market. Um, this was even before, this was even before uh, Awful Trading Company, so I, I had been uh, interested in a resource market from from the uh, from the very beginning. Um, but uh, uh, for for various reasons, we decided to develop Offworld uh, instead. And you know, this was kind of shelved for a while. But I always kind of knew at some point I wanted to get back to uh, making a, a historical historical forex. 
So once we started the game, uh, I wanted to kind of show you a sense of how it how it progressed because I think it could be really useful for a developers, uh, especially once you're starting out, to know just how ugly games can be uh, when they when they begin because it can be often you know very intimidating to, to you know compare uh, a, a prototype that you're working on to uh, finished games that you see uh, you know out. You know, out in uh, on, on Steam and on consoles and and, and whatnot. So uh, when we started off uh, Old World, you can see in the the one in the upper right there. That's from a uh, pitch video I did for a, a publisher where uh, you know I literally just I just played the game for ten minutes to show them you know what what I had done uh, so far and. Um, you know, you can see that you know it's just it's just kind of like the art is just two D billboards. Um, and you have a bunch of really, uh, you know, gross default Unity uh, UI, you know, widgets on the, the left, you know, those you can, you can probably barely make, it, excuse me, you can barely make out like a resource market. And those, those, those kind of four buttons to the right of it, that's your tech tree. Um, you see, I have a scout selected to show me the, the movement range. But even, you know, in this early version of the game, we did have orders. Um, because I knew that was something I wanted to experiment right away. Also, this was multiplayer only, the um, 2017 version. Um, it, uh, because I, I, my philosophy is, is if your game is going to be multiplayer, you want to start with multiplayer because you can, you can start you know, playing the game for real with humans so much more faster, so much faster than if you are, need to build an AI first. And building an AI early is also generally speaking a waste of time because you're just going to have to throw most of that out because the game design keeps evolving and the, the AI is always lagging behind the game design. So uh, at any rate, if, if your game can be multiplayer, I would, I would recommend trying to get that working right away um, because you can iterate really quickly. Um, you know, we would be playing games every week, basically. We play a game and then we make changes based off of, of what we experienced. Uh, we did the same thing with Offworld and with, with Civ 4. So anyway, and then you see the game progresses, the, you know, the graphics kind of slowly start to improve. And by uh, mid 2018, that's when we can see the first, for the first time characters start to show up. Um, I think it, we, there was always base, it was always part of the concept that we were gonna have characters because I had seen how popular they were in games like Crusader Kings and XCOM, but, um, uh, but of course, you know, just saying you're going to do it is not the same thing as actually you know, implementing them. And it took a while for me to to, to put that in because I never I never made a game of characters before. Um, this was a big change. A lot of the stuff I was doing up to then was kind of like redoing stuff that I had done with Civ three and Civ four, just trying to try to make it better. Um, whereas making characters was a real big leap, and it took a long time to get all that stuff right. Here's what the screens look like going up to release here. Um, you know, there's a lot to digest here. So this is really just more to give you an impression of how much the UI of a game like this can change over time and, you know, how the graphics sort of like slowly improve. Um, you can see that the, you know, for example, the mountains are pretty not great looking until, you know, we get, we get towards the end there. Um, and we were, you know, uh, you know, moving, moving, moving characters and elements of around the, of the interface all over different parts of the screen, just to kind of see how it, see how it felt. Um, but even then, you know, and even in 2018, I'd say it still looked, it looked okay. You know, like we had, we made some pretty good progress um, and, you know, it, it was sort of recognizable as a, as a sub game, sub style game. So this is a slide from the original pitch deck uh, explaining how orders work in the game. Uh, on the left, you can see, you know, what I would term every unit moves, which is the traditional way that, that Civ and frankly, most war games and a lot of board games work, um, which is just you move every unit every turn. You know, it's a very standard way of doing things. On, um, but on the right, you can see how it works with old world. Uh, it's up to the player to decide how to spend their orders. You know, they can move, they can spend all their orders on just one unit, moving them three times instead of moving three units once. Uh, it, it, you know, it really opens up the game tactically. It means that you're not locked in to play, you know, to just jumping from unit to unit to unit. You can really play out a game a thousand, a thousand play, it, play out your turn uh, a thousand different ways compared to the way you might, might be able to do it with, with uh, Civ. Now, orders didn't come out of the blue. 
Uh, instead, it came from a number of sources, uh, including some odd ones like Facebook games. Uh, here is Frontier Bill, uh, by, which was by Brian Reynolds, the designer of Civ 2, uh, which took Farmville and added an energy mechanic that limited the player's actions. Um, this was actually kind of an odd little moment in time, by the way. Three former Civ designers, myself, Bruce Shelley, and Brian, were all working at Zynga, uh, and even Sid was making uh, Civ for Facebook. At any rate, the, the, the purpose of the energy mechanic here was that you, you, know, you jump into Frontierville and you can do 20 things. You know, you know, we have 20 energy, so you can take 20 actions, whether, whether whatever that means, planting something or doing something with an animal or you know, exploring or whatever. Each one of those things took, took an, an order. Um, and then once it was out, you were done. You were supposed to step away. You know, other, other games kind of like just kept, there was always something to do. And it's, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a balanced part of it was around kind of this idea that these are games you play just periodically throughout the day. You kind of don't want to wear out your, your users by actually, it's good to let them step away. Um, but <laughs> of course, also um, note that, the, uh, that you can buy more energy in Frontierville, which was a huge part of their whole business model. Um, I didn't really have any interest in that part of it. In fact, I'd say I had anti-interest in it. Um, but I, you know, I did like it, how it made you think about what to do with your actions. You know, suddenly interesting decisions emerged. Like ultimately, like this is, this is the core of a lot of straight strategy games, right? You're, when you're making choices, you're, if you're choosing A, it means you're not choosing B, right? And giving someone a set number of, of orders or actions is a great way to do that because, um, you know, if you're going to spend your time over here, it means you're not spending your time over there. Uh, here's another example from that time period. This is a game called uh, Hero Academy from Robot Entertainment. Uh, this gave the player five actions each turn, which could be used for moves or act or acts, excuse me, which could be used for moves or attacks, however the player wanted. Uh, in fact, this went even further than Old World, as the units could attack multiple times mm -hmm. each turn. So it was really very wide open. Now, not all war games used every unit moves. Uh, this is a very old game. It was actually the first war game I ever bought as a kid. It's uh, Eric Lee Smith's Civil War game. And it used an initiative mechanic where you alternated your moves with the other side, uh, which could you allow you to move one unit, many, many hexes in one season, you know, while your other troops didn't do anything. Uh, coincidentally, this was the first war game I, well, yeah. So, um, so this is the first war game I discovered as a child. I do think its, it's rule set has always been in the back of my mind. Worker placement games are also an influence as they are all about giving the player a lot of options, but a limited number of actions. Uh, choosing to do X means you can't do Y. The things all these systems have in common is forcing the player to choose one thing and not to choose another. In other, word, in other words, you know, guns or butter which is a common phrase in, in, uh, when you talk about civ design, uh, that you're, you're always choosing between you know, guns or butter. You know? And I found that um, in, <laughs> in reality in civ, that's not actually much of a choice because uh, in traditional civ, where you can move your, your workers every single turn, um, there's no reason not to, not to do that. There's no reason not to keep building more farms or mines, right? So you're not really making a choice. Uh, in old world, you absolutely have to. You know, if you're spending your orders on combat, it means your your workers are not doing anything. So that really you know, really enforces that trade off. So the order system was always part of the design, and it gave me a reason to return to to making a civil -like game, as this one simple change would radically transform the game. Uh, there are many other things I wanted to try, but this one change was the reason to get started. Of course, like all designs, uh, just because you have an idea doesn't mean you know how to implement it. There are probably 100 ways to make an order system work. I know because I tried about 99 of them. Uh, here in the, you know, the multiplayer only version I mentioned before, uh, you can actually buy and sell orders freely on the market, just like the other resources. It was super interesting strategically, but was perhaps too interesting as it you know, warped the whole game towards who could buy the most orders. So here, here are some of all the different versions of the game, all the different versions of the order system that we tried. One was on a real-time clock, uh, one where you could stockpile unused orders between turns, one had a hard cap, and so on. 
uh, we eventually settled on a fatigue system where most units could move three times a turn, but could move farther by a forced march, which had a steep cost. Uh, we're actually still fiddling with this in our next update. We're going to have uh, sort of give, give the player an option to kind of like alter, you know, kind of choose how force march works, whether it should, it should be off or it should be double your fatigue or unlimited as it is right now. So, you know, we're, we're, ne we're never quite done working through some of these, these issues. Um, however, most of these, I, most of these ideas didn't actually get tossed away. Uh, the, the ones that we didn't, we didn't end up using, we didn't just throw them away. Instead, we, we kind of hid them away behind late game laws, things that unlock later in the game. So for example, coin debasement unlocks buying orders and elites unlock stockpile orders because they were, they were very interesting mechanics, even if we didn't think that was the way the game should work by default. So that's a useful trick if you ever try something which is interesting, but just too powerful. You don't have to, don't cut it right away. Instead, shuffle it away to the late game where it can stay interesting, but rare. So I was worried about the uh, ramification of, ramifications of orders for the AI, but in the end it worked out for the best uh, because it enables, uh, it enables the AI to actually attack on their own initiative instead of coming at the player slowly turn by turn, uh, allowing itself to get picked off. Uh, multiplayer sessions, on the other hand, were fascinating. Victorious, victorious teams were usually the ones who saved orders for their economy as roads became hugely important in order to make, uh, in order to make units more orders efficient. <laughs> the strength of the order system was the huge possibility space it created each turn because there were so many different ways to spend orders. Uh, this vast, sometimes intimidating space led to the undo feature, which kept players from feeling overwhelmed. Players could try out multiple ways to launch an attack and then just change their mind and do something else. It was initially intended to just help with misclicks, but became a, you know, a pillar of the game. And uh, you know, you'll see people uh, respond very, very positively. They'll often talk about undo first as like their favorite feature of the game, which is kind of a little strange, but, but uh, it shows just how much people like to be able to have that type of control over their games. It was also amazing for debugging too, because if you saw some, something weird happen, you don't have to be like, oh, like, can I go back to a previous save and replicate it? You just, you just hit undo and went back over the, the thing that you had just experienced. I mean, it was really saved us tons of time. Yeah, so as I mentioned, you know, undo was one of our most popular features. It was often one of the three or four bullet points, bullet, bullet points listed in the pro side of uh, in the pro column for reviews. Uh, I think it's an unexplored area in games. Um, a, a number of games like Invis Blink and Into the Breach have experimented with limited undos, but we didn't find that necessary. Uh, we, we always thought that like, oh, we'll probably have some point have to make it a little more sophisticated or, you know, not just let you undo whatever you want. But, you know, at the end of the day, we, we just discovered that players really appreciate being able to play the game however they want. Um, it helps, of course, that we have deterministic combat. Uh, games, if games that have a lot of what's called output randomness, meaning, you know, you do an attack and you're not sure what the results are going to be, which is the way it is in a lot of RPGs and in the Civ itself, uh, would not actually be a good match for the undo button because people would, you know, they'd be constantly trying to go back and do their combat slightly different way because maybe it would work out differently this time. Um, the only thing we have that's deterministic is uh, uh, critical hits, which is there's a small chance you might do double damage. Uh, but we actually even have a feature where you can turn on critical hit previews. So if your unit is going to do a critical hit this turn, you'll see a little icon on it so that you can, you can plan around it. And that's really just to actually kind of make it work with the undo system to protect the player from the set themselves so they don't um, you know, basically try every single unit just to see if they might have a critical hit. So I wrote this line in a game developer column uh, entitled Water Finds a Crack back in 2011. And it is now permanently the most popular post on my blog. Uh, it's sort of taken on a life of its own, uh, showing up in random videos uh, that other people make and other GG sock, GGC talks. And uh, it is, um, it's super applicable to uh, something called ICS. So what is ICS? Because it's a it's sort of a well-known acronym in the Civ community. So 
ICS means infinite city sprawl. It's the bane of civ designers. Uh, basically, players learned early on that the most optimal way to play was to squeeze as many cities onto the map as possible. Each iteration of the game tried a different method to fix this issue. Civ 3 had corruption, Civ 4 had maintenance, Civ 5 had global uh, unhappiness, but they were all basically unfun band-aids. Interestingly, this is actually a, a solved problem for Space 4X games. Uh, Master of Orion, uh, traditionally considered the first Space 4X, didn't have this issue because, you know, quote unquote, cities are equivalent to planets. So, you know, basically one city meant one, there's one city per planet, a planet is a city. Thus, there's a fixed number of cities in the game. You can see on the map here, this is the Master of Orion, the map doesn't scroll. This is your map. So you can see that there's whatever this is, there's like 30 or 40 city sites, city spots in the game. And that's all you'll ever get. And some of them are, some of them are not even very good good spots for, for, for that. Uh, you, you'd have to unlock certain planets with different technologies. So there's really no way to kind of spam cities in a game like this. Um, Endless Legend and Humankind do something similar with, uh, with regions, cutting the board up into territories at the start of the game and then allowing one city per territory. We tried something like this with Civ 3, but I was unsatisfied with it because uh, I felt that your choices should determine the borders between the cities, not the designer's hand before the game begins. You know, like we would, we would kind of like predetermine, like, oh, here's a bunch of chunks of territory, and you know, uh, you know, you know, France should look like this, and Italy should look like this, and Germany should look like this, and blah blah blah. And, and but you know, it's kind of like it feels like that does just feels wrong at 4,000 BC when the whole idea is like you're creating the history of the world, right? Just felt felt really really weird. So instead, I found a, a middle ground between limited city sites and dynamic growth by putting preset city sites on the map, but then all border growth after all border growth after that would be determined by the player's actions. So new borders and new territory would come from tile specialists and urban improvements. Thus, we rejected one more piece of our inheritance from Civ, as borders have always come at least since Civ 3 from a city's culture. So finally, city sites also gave us a natural place to put tribal camps, uh, which uh, is good for the pacing of the game because it helps drive conflict and ensure that the player needs to balance expansion with military, you know, and not just rush out settlers as fast as possible. Civ 5 introduced one unit per tile, which was a big change for the series. Uh, it was definitely um, another big, uh, big aspect of Civ that we needed to kind of uh, contend with because at this point, um, players kind of expect the game to work with one unit per tile because there's just so many people are playing Civ 5 and Civ 6 instead of Civ 4 and the earlier ones. Um, so we knew, that, we knew that a lot of players would expect one unit per tile. And debates in the meantime, in the sort of like the veteran community rage over Civ 4's Stacks of Doom versus Civ 5's Carpets of Doom, both of which have significant downsides. Um, however, making a big change to combat was needed for Civ 5. Uh, you know, I understand why they made that change because you know, each iteration needs to shape things up. Uh, just as Old World needed to justify its existence, so did Civ 5. Every, every version of it did. So it made sense why they would make a, a big change like this for, for Civ 5. So we started with one unit per tile simply because it was the easiest thing to code. <laughs> you know, just one unit on a tile. You don't have to worry about a stack or a list or anything. Um, but I thought I had a better solution. I thought I had a clever solution for a better stacking system. Simply put, the player could stack units, but if that tile was ever attacked, each unit on the tile would be hit equally. Um, therefore, because Old World has no counterattacks, stacking a bunch of units on the same tile would be very dangerous. So we were naturally encouraging players not to stack their units, but they could be tempted to if stacking an extra unit on a tile could get them a kill. However, before finalizing anything, we decided to try classic one unit per tile combat one more time just to see how it felt. Um, and surprisingly, it felt great. It works because Old World doesn't have counterattacks like all of the other Civ games. Combat is essentially split across multiple turns with, unit tra with units trading blows until one dies or one retreats. Uh, each separate attack is without risk. Only the target is damaged. 
The order system make this, made this necessary because allowing defenders to damage attackers is akin to giving them a free attack that doesn't cost them many orders. Excuse me. And defenders almost always have an advantage in these types of games anyway. Ultimately, however, I wanted to reward attacking because attacking is just more fun. Pictured here is a very rare version of Risk. Only a thousand copies of it were ever made. Uh, it's the one Rob Davia worked on before designing Risk Legacy, and it made one huge crucial change to the game. It added objectives, which are very important because you win the game not by conquering the world, but by simply being the first player to achieve three objectives. They were so important to achieve that they, had, that they changed how people play the game. Instead of playing defensively and turning up in Australia, players would want to go on offensives each turn to grab these objectives, which go to the first player to achieve them. You would overextend yourself to try to actually control Asia, just Asia, just because you wanted that objective, even though you knew you would lose Asia the next turn. It made for a more dynamic game because attacking is fun. Generally speaking, taking actions in games is more fun than making it harder for other players to take actions. Conservative counterplay is less fun for you, and it's definitely less fun for your opponent. Civ players are all are used to beating the AI by allowing it to kill itself against your heavily fortified units. So taking away counter da damage is a big change. But again, I wanted to reward attacking because attacking is more fun. However, allowing players to overload a combat front via stacking to get a kill took away the opportunity for the defender to counterattack. So one unit per tile was actually a very important piece of the puzzle to making our combat system work. Really, you have to look at it holistically as the three systems support each other. The biggest problem with one unit per tile in Civ is that it leads to traffic jams where units clog up the tiles between cities. City sites alleviate this problem because we can enforce a very high minimum distance between cities, much higher than in a Civ game. The order system, on the other hand, ensures that units don't block each other while moving through tight passages because every unit can make multiple moves per turn if necessary. And as I mentioned, one unit per tile balances some of the extremities of the order system by making it impossible to form stacks to kill a unit in a single turn, which removes the ability to counterattack. So the three systems fit together nicely, you know, but, but excuse me. So the three systems, you know, they fit together nicely, buttressing one another. Now that we felt good about the gameplay, we felt it was safe to start exposing publishers to our ideas. This is the first slide of our pitch deck. Note that it used to be called 10 crowns, and the simple elevator pitch is right there in the first slide. The fun of civilization plus the drama of Crusader Kings. Expect many things to change about your design, including the title, but it's important to have a core vision that doesn't change. Indeed, most of the reviews for Old World describe the game exactly this way, as a hybrid of Civ and Crusader Kings. Now, the initial impetus for characters originally came from the popularity of Crusader Kings. We could see how much players latch onto real characters who are born, grow, age, decline, and die. It's not just CK, though. You could see this trend um, from XCOM through the Total War series, uh, all the way up to get new games like Wildermyth. People want to care about the characters in their games. However, the bigger question is why would a game like Civ benefit from characters? First off, we should mention that it's actually impossible to put flesh and blood people into Civ because the game covers 6,000 years of history. That's why we limited our time frame to just classical antiquity so that the game could plausibly last a few generations. Nonetheless, ignoring the thematic issues, how would characters change the gameplay of Civ? To answer that question, let's talk about another long-standing problem with Civ, known as ECS, the Eternal China Syndrome. It means that over time, Civs become more stable, less dynamic, and less interesting to manage. As they add more and more buildings and wonders and laws and technologies, the internal problems get less and less interesting. A bonus that was interesting 30 turns ago now just fades into the background. The only real pressure exerted on the player is from external forces, enemy players. Characters, however, provide a way out of the ECS problem. Buildings and technologies never get old and die, but characters sure do. If we, if we attach characters to, 
sorry, if we attach powers to characters, the game will shift as different leaders take and leave the throne. Not to mention new courtiers, heirs, counselors, spouses, and so on. The dynastic landscape is constantly changing. Civ might be a lot more interesting if, say, the map changed every so many turns. But fortunately, that just doesn't make any sense thematically, even if it would be good for gameplay. However, characters changing, growing old, and dying doesn't just make sense. Players expect it to happen. I can't overstate how significant this is. Taking powers away from the player in civilization is basically a non-starter. Yet here is a situation where players would be upset if they didn't lose these powers. Indeed, we can add powers to characters that would normally be impossible to be added to the game if they were accretive in the way Civ usually works, meaning that once you unlock the power, it never goes away. Each character in uh, an old world is one of 10 archetypes, each with special powers if that archetype sits on the throne. Because players only have partial control of archetypes, we can add significant game-changing abilities here, knowing that they will be active roughly 10% of the time. Hero leaders can, can launch offensives, which allows units to attack twice a turn. Orators can hire tribal units as mercenaries. Tacticians can stun enemy units, and so on. And beyond that, if you had all of these powers kind of like that could be available at the same time, it's, you know, it just, it, it, you know, there's, it's sort of a, an inflation of, of, of abilities. You know, here you can, you basically force the player to have no more than one of them, uh, you know, active at, at any one time. Um, so it leads to a really interesting system. Dynamic characters are also a huge boon for diplomacy, an area where sudden changes are always tricky to pull off. In Civ games, if a friendly ally suddenly attacks you, it's often described as uh, random or unpredictable AI, even though it's crucial for the flow of the game that the AIs are willing to change their opinion of you, or else the eternal China syndrome applies to them as well. With characters, however, it's expected that a nation will change its opinion of you when a new ruler takes the throne. We didn't design this, it just flows naturally from adding real people into the game. Thus, a problem that has been doubled Civ for decades was solved in a way that feels natural to the player. After shipping Civ 3, one thing I heard often from the Civ 2 community was that the mining tools lack support for something called events, which I eventually learned meant a system of triggers and effects that modders could use to give the games a narrative arc. It could create a series of chapters, for example, which push the story forward when the player achieves certain milestones. I tried out a series of mods to see what was possible and was surprised to see how effectively people could push the Civ engine to create something completely new. For example, here is a Civ 2 Fellowship, uh, Fellowship of the Ring mod, which lets you retrace Frodo's journey from the Shire to Moria, encountering all the events of the book along the way. So to enable this type of narrative focused mod, we added triggers and effects to Civ 4 using Python as a scripting language and ultimately just released the game source code itself, which led to some amazing mods like Fall From Heaven and Dune Wars, both of which completely transformed the game and proved the amazing potential for both story and modding in Forex games. However, although I had given modders all the power they needed, I hadn't actually done the work myself on how to make narrative work in a Forex game. I noticed that events were starting to show up in various strategy games with increasing depth and complexity. They added real texture to the experience and perhaps more importantly, variety. The most interesting mixture of strategy and events was the cult classic King of Dragon Pass, uh, a 1999 game that vanished without a trace on release and then somehow snowballed into a hit decades later as word spread of its wild mix of traditional forex strategy clan management, and dynamic narrative. The event system was the star, and your choices largely determined the path your game took, often in wildly unpredictable ways. Each event forced you, forces you to make difficult, difficult trade-offs between the demands of various factions, both internal and external to your tribe, just as we wanted to do with Old World. However interesting this was, it's not a game I could make. First of all, the game has an actual beginning, middle, and end, and I have neither the interest nor the ability to tell a single cohesive story. More importantly, Dragon Pass doesn't tell you the effects of your decisions. You're meant to just intuit the results, which works for some games, but not for Old World. 
a game where transparency is one of the most important design aesthetics. The event system might surprise you, but the direct result of each of your decisions needs to be clear. For me, the promise of a strategy game is understanding what's going to happen each time you click a button while still not being able to predict the future. So, because transparency was important, and we'll talk about transparency a lot tomorrow as well, I turned to the world of board games for inspiration. Specifically, the narrative, the dynamic narrative masterpiece, Tales of the Arabian Nights, which comes with a game book of over 2,000 events randomly drawn from a deck of cards, and which both react to and can change the player's current state. The mechanics for choosing events and how they affect the player are transparent and easy to understand, which was necessary because, as with all board games, the players have to do all the work themselves. So, for example, having the wit and charm trait might help you escape a vengeful sorceress, while an unlucky player without that trait may end up and may end up ensorcelled, which will cause further events down the road. What inspires me about the system was that it was robust. It's not an intricate event tree where missing a node might cause a story change to break. Instead, the events are loosely coupled as they are meant to work together, regardless of which random set you draw each time you play the game. One of the benefits of a loosely coupled system is that multiple authors could, could create events at the same time without requiring close collaboration or really any collaboration. Here are some of the authors of the over 3,000 events currently in Old World, led by our CEO and creative director, Layla Johnson. Many of these writers worked on the project at diff completely different times, creating dynamic story arcs by accident. One writer might add an event that results in your leader becoming a drunk, while another author, years later, creates an event that only triggers if the leader is a drunk. And now we have the makings of a little story. Indeed, as we add more events with each bi-weekly bi update, the story system becomes more and more cohesive as more events are added to cover all the unusual permutations that might happen for each playthrough. Here are some of the possible inputs that the event system can look for, and most of these can be changed by the system as well. So the event system is a virtual deck of events where each one has a potential trigger, such as meeting a new nation, a set of requirements, like a childless leader, and possible effects, like a foreign spouse. It's a broad, deep system that makes one look forward to each new turn to see what will happen next. What I might be proudest of is that the multiplayer community for Old World plays with events turned on. We'd assume that players who wanted to play competitively with each other would be put off by the randomness of the system, but they feel like the game is not complete without it. In fact, we put a lot of work into maintaining an alternate version of the game without events or characters or families or all the things that increase randomness. But I'm glad to say that it was probably you know, not, not super useful. Players, you know, because players want just, they, they, they like the events. One of the best things about the event system is that it adds content to the game without bloating the design, without adding new rules for the player to learn. We currently have over 3,000 events, but doubling or tripling that number will only add variety to the, game, to the game without adding any more complexity. Often, with strategy games, less is more, but this is one place where more is actually more. It's the same reason why card-based war games like Twilight Struggle and We the People have become popular. It creates a deeper experience while keeping a slimmer rule set. Ultimately, the event system ensures that no two games play out the same way, as there are endless possible stories as one, lead, as one event leads into another, changing the path of your game while your in-game choices feed back into the event system itself. I accidentally built an interactive fiction engine inside of a 4X game, and I'm very excited to see where our writers and the body community can take it. Um, so I want to talk here a little bit about um, diplomacy and uh, the bargaining table. Um, this is the the uh, bargaining table from Civ three. Uh, it was a it was a new feature in the, in um, uh, in the series at the time. You know the idea is like we wanted to make diplomacy a little more interesting and deep and and. Hmm, you know, sophisticated. So we're like, okay, well, we'll let you trade anything, you know, anything you could put on one side of the table will be on one side and anything they can put on the other side. So they could trade 
uh, a peace treaty or a technology or a world map or luxuries or gold or cities even. Um, and, you know, it led to, uh, you know, a system where you could, you could customize all these interesting deals. Unfortunately, it was, it was a big mistake. My first inkling that there was a problem was after SIP3 ship and people started to complain that the AIs all tended to have the same technologies. The reason was, was that the AIs were using the bargaining table the same way humans did. Every time they got a new technology, they would contact all of their friends, rivals, and even enemies to see what they could get in return by trading that technology away, which cost them nothing, but could get them a little something in return. From the human's perspective, it looked like the AIs were part of a giant tech cartel and were selling techs to each other at bargain prices. But the AI was simply pursuing the optimal strategy. Again, we have a system where the players were ruining the game for themselves because there was no cost to contacting every sieve every turn and also endlessly tinkering, tinkering with how to get the best deal possible. No reason not to just put one more gold on their side of the table until you've hit the AI's maximum price for what you are trading away. There are ways to mitigate this issue, but this is a uh, cursed game design problem uh, as defined by Alex Jeffy in his fantastic 2019 GDC talk, which I recommend everyone should take the time to watch as it's available on, on YouTube. Uh, there is a conflict here between the power and flexibility of the bargaining table and the give and take of real diplomacy where flawed personalities come into play and you can't nickel and dime a rival without offending them. Ultimately, we come back to this. There is no real solution here, here because we are giving the player all the tools to ruin the game for themselves. Fortunately, Old World has a system in place that could solve this problem by replacing the bargaining table with something else. The event system. Here is one example. Um, you married a Babylonian many years ago, and now because of that connection, you must choose a side in the war between Babylon and Carthage. The system presents the player with interesting diplomatic events and choices that react to the current game state, serving up possible paths to war at a pace that is healthy for the player. Getting rid of the bargaining table was a risky decision because players expect it by now, but the end result could be so much more dynamic and interesting and free. It could be so much more dynamic and interesting and free the player of the burden of trying to min max the table. So when you ask another nation for a truce or for a trade mission or to start an alliance, the game gathers all the events with those specific triggers, throws out the ones that are not applicable to your current situation, such as the events that, were, that require a child ruler, and then randomly picks one to present you. Angry nations are still less likely to want to trade with you, but the actual result of a trade mission will still be unexpected, making it a worthwhile gamble to take. In this example, you can get out of a war if you captured a hostage during combat, a good example of the loosely coupled events I mentioned earlier. In this example, based on the story from Livy of a meeting between Hannibal and Scipio Africanus after the end of the Second Punic War, you are forced to choose who is the best general, either one of your own or one of theirs. You must choose between damaging your own legitimacy or angering your guests. These incidents stir the pot of diplomacy and make the game dynamic. Here, um, getting back to kind of the last, this is actually my last slide, but uh, here, uh, Rome is offering you one of its unique units, uh, status as a mercenary. A good example of something we'd be afraid to put on the bargaining table because it would be abusable, but it works fine as a random event because it's not guaranteed to appear. You know, you could probably play a number of games before you even, you even see an event like this. So that's uh, that's old world. I want to kind of cover some of the you know some of the things I thought were cool about the design about the game, why why we did them, um, but I also wanted to give time for questions for anything people want to ask. About, about old world or any of the things I, any of the things I brought up. So uh, let me see who's, who's got their hand up. Um, uh, Jean-Paul, go ahead and can he, can he unmute himself? I'm not sure. Yep. Can't hear you though. Jean-Paul, we can't hear you. Uh, we can hear you speak. You could type it in chat, maybe, I guess.
Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. I think uh, that was the only thing we heard, uh, Jean Paul. Yeah, I think you should probably type because it's not coming through very well. Um, all right, well, there's a question from Vincent about what is what is the team size composition at the beginning of the problem um, versus uh, beginning of the project versus at launch versus post-launch? Um, so the team was very small at the beginning. I mean, the, the very beginning, I really would say it's sort of just a team of one and a half, right? It's just me and someone just, you know, giving me the very basic graphic support so I could I could draw stuff on the screen. Um, so that's the that's the, the very minimum size. But then I would say that within the next two years, um, you know, we probably grew to, you know, we probably had maybe up to 10 people on the game. Um, and then the last couple of years of the game, you know, which is what you call production. Uh, at that point, we, at one point, we probably were up to 40 or 50 people. Um, it kind of depends how you count them because that includes musicians and, you know, people, contract artists who were, you know, just kind of doing little bits and pieces there, but I could get up to about that about that size. And now that we're after you know the game is released, now we're kind of down to like more like a fifteen or twenty person team um, because we we don't need we are we're not making new art. Well, we're making new some some new art, but we're mostly making um, we're mostly mostly making new events. You know, we're writing, we're making scenarios, we're doing design work. Uh, we're still. Uh, you know, doing programming work, we're still developing aspects of the game. Um, but, uh, you know, the kind of like the, the pure production aspect of like the art and the, the sound and the music is, is over. Um, so, uh, Jean-Paul asked, did you find that the undo button gave decision paralysis? Um, maybe, I mean, I think there, for some, for some players that is, it is possible, but, I think you can kind of look at it both ways, right? Like have, knowing that you have the undo button also gives you the flexibility to like just start doing stuff. You're like, well, I'm just going to see what happens because I know I can I can back it out. Um, so it's uh, it's weird. I don't think there's I don't think there's a simple answer to that beyond the fact that just that um, it's you know it, there there's not a perfect answer for any one personality type, right? I, I think that it's 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 you know, just, just from playing the game, I can tell from experience that, that, that people like not feeling like they, um, they are locked into their decisions. So, you know, I think it's, it's the right choice, but certainly it's something that I think people do sometimes have to uh, adapt to. Um, Leila gave some more details about the headcount also in the chat. Um, and I do know that when I, when I play other games now, especially turn-based ones, um, yeah, although it even sometimes comes into my head in real time ones, which is you know even stranger. But um, if I play games now, every time I do something and I like, oh, I that's not what I want to do. I like I want to reach for the undo button, but it's not there, and I feel <laughs> I feel limited. So uh, I don't know if it's something that's going to become a convention or not. But it's definitely something that once you get used to, it's really hard to live without. Um, there's another question from Vincent. What percentage of the gameplay vision was finalized in designers' minds at the start of the project, and how did you evolve as you go? Uh, well, it's hard to describe the percentage, but I did try to get the cross in that slide of like, you know, the fun of civilization plus the drama of Crusader Kings, right? Like that's that's kind of always been the the guiding principle for the game. And, and not, you know, it's not just, you know, like normally people say, like, oh, Civ plus Crusader Kings. Well, that's really too shorthand. That's not really very descriptive. That's why, like, we actually have spent there, like, the fun of civilization and the drama of Crusader Kings, because there are certain parts of those projects, we, games that we want. The fun of civilization, to me, is that like it's a it's a transparent game that grows slowly. People get you know people get sucked into. They feel like their decisions matter. They feel that they can plan. They can win. They can lose. Um, you know, it's a uh, um, you know it's a very compelling game. We want to get that aspect in there which I don't necessarily feel like 
is is there in the same way in a game like Crusader Kings. Um, what Crusader Kings has in spades is, is drama, right? Um, because what people like to do is talk about the story of these crazy things happen to you in their, in, in their game. I can't believe what my stepbrother did to my kids or whatever, right? Like, um, and uh, <laughs> so we wanted to get that aspect in it. But, you know, everything has to fit together in some cohesive way, really. Like, mostly the game is like Civ. It's like two thirds Civ and more like one third Crusader Kings, right? Like, it's, um, you know, that's, that's the kind of the, the, the ratio that works because, um, you know, the randomness of Crusader Kings still has to fit into a framework where it's really actually still a game, you know, something where you can, you can win or you can lose. Um, almost everything else about the design can shifted considerably over the course of the game, right? Like it was called 10 crowns because there were going to be 10 rulers. You know, like the game would last 10 rulers, right? And that, that just, that turned out not to be feasible, right? So that got, that got, got dropped, for example. Um, yeah, uh, someone mentioned about there's a racing game with a rewind option. Yeah, I mean, uh, one, of my, one of my favorite games of all time is Sands of Time, right? Which is Prince of Persia Sands of Time, which is a real time game with, an, with a rewind uh, feature. It was, it was limited. You would kind of like, it was like a fuel gauge and then you'd rewind it. It, it worked really well. I mean, I, I'm sure that was probably in the back of my mind as well. Um, uh, Hello, for a, profile, for a portfolio, what type of things can we showcase when it comes to designing and strategy games? I'm currently using Divinity Original Sin Engine to design levels. Do you think that's good? Uh, or do you think using Unity or Unreal is better? I think if you are if you want to design, if you want to showcase your design skills, uh, I think modding games is a great way to go um, because you're not going to be spending half of your time just trying to get over the initial bar of having anything work at all, right? Um, I mean, there, there's some people who can do amazing work by themselves in a small engine, but like oftentimes, I, I feel like that was kind of like the heyday of like Flash, right? Like you could you can make these really interesting simple projects, but even even Unity is still requires a lot of of uh, sort of term for it. Just plumbing, just to get just the stuff working. <laughs> Anytime I've tried to like hack together something in Unity, it's it's never gotten to the point where I'm like, oh, this is even remotely fun, right? Uh, you might be frankly even better off with something like Game Maker, uh, which you know lets you get into things faster. But I mean, even better than that maybe is being able to make some some cool mod for uh, you know for Old World or you know any other any other strategy or RPG that lets you do that because. <laughs> You can really demonstrate like, okay, I'm just what I'm really doing here is design work. There's no reason why a good designer shouldn't be able to do good work inside of someone else's engine. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, geez. Sorry. This is much more talking than I've been doing while I've been sick. All right. Um, would you consider the multiplayer mode? To the end game, or can it be played solo to its fullest? Uh, yeah, no, I mean the single player and multiplayer—they're just alternate ways to play old world. They're <coughs> both. Just, you mean I guess made you mean end game like um, the elder game, like people talk about in MMO, of like people eventually graduate from single player to multiplayer. I, no, I think it's more of personality types. There's some people who like playing multiplayer um, because they really want to. They wanted the thrill of playing against other people. It, it, things are, you know, things are never going to be the same, and you have to constantly watching the balance of the game. And um, <clears throat> you, you will be learning from your opponents. You want to be able to do the exact same things they are, right? Like it's kind of built around a symmetrical experience, um, and that just takes a certain personality type, type. Some people like that. Some people don't. And there's a lot of players who they really they would never touch multiplayer. But I would encourage people though to at least consider that. Um, we have a lot of cooperative modes in the game, right? Like there's a, you can t there's a there's a fun barbarian uh, horde scenario where it's just you against the barbarians. You can play with another person, right? Like you have your civ, they have you have your nation, they have their nation, and you're allied, and you're helping each other, you know, fight it off. So there's there's lots of other ways to play with people beyond, you know, strict competitive. And even competitive has free for all with like, you know, seven people all against each other. 
as instead or you could play 3v3 you know there's 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 lots of different ways to, ways to do it but i think it's a personality thing there's a lot of people who just will only want to play the game single player and even within a single player there's people who are they're just builders you know they just they they want to they want to sort of slowly just build up their power and they want a fairly easy experience there's people who are role players they they, they like the crazy events you know we allow them to like turn the mortality up and you know, level up and then there's min maxers people who you know want to compete on the like the game of the week and see just you know how they can how best they can do against the highest difficulty levels um uh another question i had a question why is the base building strategy is abandoned like command and conquer and new games are more like total wars than the ones you're showing um uh well <laughs> i would say old world is still pretty much very much a base building type game um you know you start with a single settler and you kind of snowball from trying to snowball from there um but certainly i mean i just think uh I think video game design is um, branching out. You know, it's um, you know, their RTS. An RTS used to mean a very, very. I'll talk about actually. I'll literally talk about this tomorrow. But uh, RTS is initially mean a very specific thing because there was you know there was Doom Two and there there was uh, uh, Command and Conquer and you know everything kind of like splintered off of that. But it, it kind of had a very rigid set of design of like, okay, you have a base and you have some, some villagers and then you have your tanks and you go attack the other guy and so on and so forth. Um, it took a while for people to understand that like, okay, RTSs could just, could mean all sorts of different things, right? Um, and essentially, you know, like a MOBA, you know, League of Legends is a descendant of an RTS. It's just with all the macro stripped out. And Offworld is a descendant of an RTS just with all the micro stripped out. So, and you know, Total War, you know, is, a, is an RTS as well, just, um, you know, they don't, the, the base building, quote, unquote, happens during the turn-based aspect, aspect of the game. So, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's nice that there's, there's different ways to play. Um, yeah, no, I meant end game as in gameplay, end game. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, you see, if you start game single player, it ends single player. If you start game multiplayer, it ends multiplayer. That's, that's how it, how it works. Um, all right, uh, I'm trying to see if I missed any uh, important questions. I think I got everything best as I can tell. You know, we'll, we'll do some more questions at the end. Um, And uh, I think I will maybe officially take a, a um, like a five minute break if that's okay uh, before we launch into the next one when I talk about. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm going to shut off the camera for just a little bit. All right, Taib, uh, we'll be back in like five ish minutes. So see you all at well, it's currently seven thirty nine for me. So let's say seven forty five. Yeah, Allah. See you guys. <laughs> All right, welcome back everyone. Um, should I just get started again? All right, so um, I will take that for yes. And uh, um, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a shorter presentation here on uh, writing AI for civ games um, and why that's kind of a unique, kind of a unique challenge. Um, first, I'm going to do a little history of civilization, the series itself. Uh, although all of this, all of this is kind of in the context of just up through Civ Four. I don't really, I didn't work on Civ Five or Civ Six, so I'm not really going to address anything about about those games. Um, Civ One was uh, the you know the original it came out in 1991, over 30 years ago. Some of you were not born yet, which <laughs> went crazy for me, but. Um, it's a classic god game um, and uh, simple, you know, simple turn-based mechanics. Then Civ 2, you know, which was a sequel, which is actually a little unusual back then. They didn't really actually make that many sequels. It's hard to believe, but back then it was kind of a little unusual to make a sequel. But Civ, was, Civ 1 was such a huge hit. Um, and Civ 2 was kind of a, kind of a uh, stay, very standard sequel in the sense of they just added more units, and more buildings, technology. They switched to a new type of view, an isometrics view, add some complexity like uh, hit points, 
and they first added the first editor into the game. Civ 3 was where I first became involved in the series. Um, that was in 2001. We added some big new features like culture and diplomacy. You know, we had the flexible diplomacy, which I, you know, I talked about, you know, before the break. Uh, we added a rules editor to the game. Uh, they had things like unit animations, right? Like, uh, <laughs> we're really moving along. Uh, Civ 4 uh, was the first title that I was, you know, I was lead on from beginning to end. Uh, we added religion and great people. We actually simplified a lot of mechanics from Civ 1 and Civ 2 and, and 3 um, that, uh, you know, we kind of reassessed like, okay, this game's been around for a while. What are some of the things we can actually pull out to make the game a little more a little more accessible and actually find room for these other ideas we want to stick into it. Uh, it was built as multiplayer from, excuse me, the very beginning, which was a, a brand new thing for the series. Um, and all the game data was stored in XML, which made it great for, for modding, uh, very flexible. And a lot of other uh, uh, the events, you know, sort of an, an event modding system and the UI was all done in Python, which made it very easy to to mod the game, which led to some really cool stuff. Um, and it was the first the first 3D SIP uh, game. So now I'm going to talk about AI a little bit. Um, and I want to talk about a continuum between what I will term um, good AI and fun AI. So good AI means that uh, you're writing an AI to beat the player at their own game. You know, essentially, it's a, it's a human substitute. You know, you, you have this game and you would normally play with another person, but you want to be able to play it at your own pace or you're, you know, you're lost, you're, you're locked on a dead, you're, lo you're, <laughs> you're on a desert island or something, you know, there's no humans around, so you're going to have to play with the, uh, the AI. So that's, that's what good AI is for. It's, it's first uh, to, to basically replace a, a human. Fun AI, however, is where the algorithms themselves are the content, that the AI is doing interesting things, but the point is not necessarily to beat the player. It's to kind of make the, the process, the, the experience itself interesting. Um, and this is where it's, it's deeper than just game mechanics. It's, you know, the AI is, a, the, the game is adapting to uh, what you're doing. Um, you know, so the focus here is just on the player's experience. So, you know, the classic, you know, the classic example of uh, good AI is, you know, chess AI, right? Uh, here's Deep Blue, which I think was the first, uh, I think the first chess AI that, you know, could really beat, you know, the best players in the world here. They're, they're going up against uh, Gary, it's going up against Gary Kasparov and the, uh, the you know, the gentleman seated on the right, he's just, he's just moving the pieces however the, uh, the AI tells him to move, move because this guy would have no chance otherwise of beating uh, Mr. Kasparov. Um, in fact, uh, good AI can go so far, and you know, we might get to a point well, with this with chess, I suppose, where it can solve games, right? Like now, it's now literally impossible to beat uh, a checkers AI because it's it's able to. Uh, I don't know how. I actually don't remember exactly how they do that. Whether they do it through brute force search or something else, but basically, you know, they they can look so far ahead that they can make sure that they'll never make a move where they could they could lose. So good AI is typically done in put in games where uh, you're again it's a human substitute. You're you're playing what are often war games. Uh, you know it's kind of like the first place in video games where they started writing these AIs because you had all these people who who like playing war games but didn't really have a chance to play with other people. Um, you know because this was actually in the pre-internet days, um, and uh, you know it just it. It was a way to play a game that wouldn't normally actually be, be possible to be played. So with fun AI, uh, the algorithms themselves are the content. So like here's uh, you know, an old game called Black and White, which um, was a, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how to describe it now, but, but you, know, the, you, you sort of trained this creature over the course of the game and the creature had this kind of interesting AI behind it where it would, it would kind of learn, you know, if you were cruel to it, it would learn to be afraid to you. If it was nice to, if you were nice to it, it would kind of you know, be, your, be, your, be your buddy. Um, and in the, the other pitch game here is The Sims where, you know, you're kind of creating, you know, you, you create uh, 
you know, these houses and you put the, you lay these furniture down um, and you can start fires and whatnot. And like the, what the, what the, uh, the AIs that control the Sims, that that's what makes the game interesting, seeing how the Sims respond to this environment that you, you put them in. Um, and so there wouldn't be really a game there if there wasn't kind of this interesting AI behind what the players do, but there's no concept of them trying to beat the player, right? Um, this is uh, a tower defense game called uh, Desktop Tower Defense. is one of the first ones uh, kind of like it. There is, of course, all sorts of games like this now. But uh, the point is, is that, you know, these, these characters, the, these little blobs that move across the screen, they are controlled by AI, but the whole point is that they behave very predictably. Um, you know that these type of creeps always do this and these types do that, and that determines how you, you know, you lay out the board and how you, 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 you want to play the game, you know, just, just because um, uh, you wouldn't want the AI to behave uh, unpredictably or in a, in a very smart way to outwit you, right? Like they're, they're a, a persistent benchmark that you measure yourself up against. You know, so with, with fun AI, the, the focus very much is on, on the player. Um, these are, you know, shots from, from, uh, from WoW, um, World of Warcraft. And um, I bring this up because I'm talking, I want to talk about aggro, which is a concept that's, you know, very common in, in MMO games. You have this idea that you have these, some, some classes are aggro classes where they can basically force the, the AI monsters to attack that character, right? Um, so it, it's a way to basically literally control the AI. Um, and... You know, there are, you know, in, um, in MMOs, there's typically three basic classes, right? You have tanks, which have high defense, there's the healers, and then there's the DPS characters who actually do the damage. And the AI determines who the AI attacks. So, um, you know, the, uh, you know, when the, if you, if you were someone designing one of these games um, and you wanted to beat the human, it's, it's pretty easy to figure out how. You know, you would, you know, you would, um, you know, I guess, well, sorry, let me rephrase this. The point is, is that when, when they write a code to determine what the monsters do in, in, in WoW, um, you allow the players to manipulate it because aggro, aggro is kind of like part of the, the, the game mechanics. It kind of lets, lets the human control that one thing because there's only so many other variables here, right? There's like defense and there's healing and there's, there's damage and then there, there's aggro. Um, if, you know, if, you were, if the whole point was to beat the human, you wouldn't let the humans manipulate the, the aggro. Um, but predictability is a hallmark of this, this, type, of, this type of AI. So, You've got this uh, strategy AI spectrum, um, which goes from you know good AI on one side to fun AI on the other side. Um, now, of course, not all games um, will always fit perfectly on either end. Most games, in fact, are going to be somewhere in the middle. And where in the middle is is kind of kind of interesting. Um, so. Uh, StarCraft is going to be more on the, the good side, but at the same point, I don't think it'll be quite as extreme as chess, where you just want the, the, the AI to do whatever, you know, whatever is the most ruthless thing to, to beat the player. But the, the point is basically they're still kind of a human substitute. You know, games like Heroes of Might and Magic, uh, this is much more asymmetrical. Uh, the, the focus really is on the, 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 human, the, the human player's experience. Uh, you want, you know, you want dragons to behave a certain way, you want, you know, elves to behave a certain way, and you want, you know, you, the, the creatures to be, be somewhat, to be somewhat predictable. Civ is kind of interesting because it kind of gets stuck somewhere in the middle. Um, you kind of think of it as uh, it should be more like StarCraft or chess, where you're, the AI is a human substitute, but Civ didn't start out as a multiplayer game, right? It started out as a single player game. Um, and so really the single player uh, experience really is uh, of utmost importance, even though it looks more like a game like chess than it does like desktop tower defense. Uh, it doesn't look like an asymmetrical game, but, it, but ultimately it actually really is one. And I'll go into detail about that through the rest of the, the talk here. And one of the key reasons why it is, is because of diplomacy. But let's go into more detail about this, this spectrum. So the rules over time, have, do the game, does the game, do, do the rules of the game change? Um, 
if a game is fixed, has fixed rules that, that, are, that are never changed, I mean, the rules of chess haven't changed for hundreds of years, that's going to be more on the good AI side. If there's something that's, that's evolving, um, there that there's you know constantly changing, there's basically no way to write a you know a perfect AI for those type of games. So that's more on the fun side. Uh, I've used this term these terms a lot already. Um, symmetrical games are going to be more on the uh, good AI side, where fun AI is all about asymmetrical games, where the human is playing a completely different game from from the AI. Typically, um, you know, good AI is more of a multiplayer thing, um, or you know, they take games that were multiplayer and you know, you know, they're they're slot sliding a, uh, an AI in, whereas fun AI is, is really much more useful tool for a single player. Um, although you know, the, 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 you know, this, all these things are are tweaked, right? Like they're, uh, you know, if you play a game like uh, League of Legends, right, like. That has some predictable AI in it, right? Like the, the, the creeps in those games are, uh, you know, essentially very similar to tower defense type things. Um, and so, you know, it, one of the things that makes the, the game work is that it has that type of like basic predictable AI in there. Um, so these are all, these are only just these are sort of just broad strokes. This one's a little um, uh, kind of trickier to describe for what tactics are available to the AI, right? Like in, in chess, everything that's available for the human is should be available to the AI, right? You're not gonna write chess AI where the, ch where the, the AI uh, doesn't castle, right? Like you're like, well, the AI will do everything except it won't castle, right? Because maybe we, we don't like castling, right? Like, no, you're not gonna do that. The, it's, it's built in that the AI is gonna do everything the human does. Whereas on the, uh, you know, the, the other side, uh, you're, you're intentionally choosing what the AI will and won't do. You know, you're just arbitrarily deciding that like we, in, in the desktop de defense games, the creeps are always gonna go in one direction. They're not gonna slowly decide to reverse course and go the other way just because maybe that will lead to some better, better thing. Um, I mean, you might make that choice, but it's, it's going to be intentional. You're arbitrarily deciding what the AI is and isn't gonna do. So, <laughs> The other thing about good versus funny AI is good AI you can actually kind of objectively measure, right? Like with um, with you know Deep Blue is you know is very much this was a a long process of like could could the um, could the AIs eventually beat a chess grandmaster, right? Eventually they, they got there, right? And then now there's other objective measures. They kind of measure, I think now chess AI sort of measure themselves against each other. I think the same thing happens for like StarCraft AIs. For um, fun AI, it's completely subjective, right? Like there's no way of determining, okay, well, how good is the AI in a, in a tower defense game? Well, it's really just, it, this is game design, right? Like how, um, how much fun is the player having? Is it, is, it, is it effectively supporting that? Finally, the old Turing test, right? Um, you know, chess AI technically passes the Turing test beyond the fact that like you always, <laughs> you would always lose now. So that's not maybe very human. Uh, maybe it's too good. Um, but you know, the Turing test is completely irrelevant for fun AI. No one thinks that, that there's a human controlling, you know, all of the, the characters running around at a tower, tower defense game. So, you know, here's, here's a summary that kind of puts all these things, all these categories, or, you know, these uh, razors or whatever on, on different sides. Uh, where, um, and uh, another way to kind of describe these whole categories of good and fun AI is a good AI is playing to win a game, right? Like the whole point is to beat the player um, because it's, it's a human substitute that's trying to not make any compromises and like it's supposed to beat you at your own game. Fun AI is playing to lose. Like the whole point they are there is they're, they're an interesting obstacle for the human to overcome. Like that's, that's, that's their purpose. So what about, what about Civ AI? Is it play to win or is it play to lose? Well, as, as I mentioned, Civ is kind of somewhere in the middle. So it's, it's gonna be kind of a difficult, a difficult thing to, difficult question. We're not gonna be able to answer it simply. So let's talk about each of these different categories here. Civ has kind of both fixed rules and an evolving design. Obviously it's been evolving because we're on Civ 6 now, right? It constantly changes. But there are some things about the game that, that, that there are some things that all six versions of Civ have, and even Old World, have, they, they share. Some things that have not changed, um, like the way the, the, uh, the, you know, this is the, the way the tile system works and, um, 
you know, the you know, rivers and continents and cities and uh, units and so on and so forth. So there, there are some things that don't change, but constantly, you know, we're, we're bringing new things in. And because, because the game's evolving like that, you know, we, we, there, there isn't some, uh, beyond like maybe A star or something like that, there isn't some algorithm that's been maintained over the six versions of Civ uh, to, that can be brought forward. Uh, Civ is a symmetrical game. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, all the, all the, like, you know, you play an eight player game of Civ, everyone starts with the settler on 4,000 BC. Old World is not a symmetrical game, by the way. It's intentionally asymmetrical. If you play it, you'll realize that the AI actually starts with a bunch of cities and you, the whole idea is that you're a new nation in this older, in this old world. Right. And I, I, one of the reasons I did that is really to break this concept so people would stop thinking of it as a symmetrical game. The AI doesn't have uh, ambition victory is not a thing in the old world. It's not, it's not possible for the AI. It's only applies to the humans. Um, and that's because I was trying to get out of this plane to win category. I wanted to push us more onto the fun AI plane to lose side. Um, Civ is still primarily a single player game. That's what most people uh, uh, approach it for. Um, it's a game with, um, uh, it's, it's a game with limited options. This might be surprising. You, do you think that maybe, um, we allow the AI to do everything the human can, uh, in, uh, in Civ, but we don't actually, we, we definitely limit the stuff they do. This is, I talked about this a little bit at the end of the, uh, old world presentation where, uh, we talked about the diplomacy problem in the bargaining table. So even though the AI can contact each other every turn and trade all their technologies, that's something that we eventually determined was bad. And so we don't have the AI do that anymore. Um, so we will definitely take options off the table. We don't, we don't have them just arbitrarily decide to always attack the, the player in the lead, um, things like that, right? Um, this one, this one maybe is hard to, hard to judge, but there is still some sort of like objective testing of whether the Civ AI is good or not. Um, and it is maybe a little bit more in the, I know it when I see it category, as opposed to Civ, this chess where there is maybe some sort of a benchmark. Um, but you know, generally speaking, you can tell when the AI in Civ is bad and it's bad because it's not playing the game. You know, it's not, it's not executing the game the way you would, would want it to, the way you feel like you would play with the same, same units. Um, finally, it just straight up fails um, the, the Turing test. You know, we're not, we're not trying to, we're not trying to pass it. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the fact that people will talk about um, you know, in, in, in diplomacy, they're like, oh, the AI suddenly backstab me and like, oh, I, you know, I hate it. It's, 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 uh, it's random. Well, you know what, who does that? Humans do that. Um, people don't expect when they're playing uh, a multiplayer game of uh, Civ, uh, unless there's some agreement ahead of time, you don't expect other humans to role play, right? Like, oh, we were buddies and so on and so forth. Like, you know, maybe that works out, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily expect it. You wouldn't hold it against the player if they turn against them because you can't, you can, by definition, whatever they do is okay because they're a human, you know, they're, they're being human. Um, whereas, you know, we still have a kind of a sense of, of what it's okay or what, how, what, what is the range is in which we'd like to see the AI uh, perform. So uh, the art of strategy AI, AI, the art of strategy AI is figuring where you fit on the spectrum and striking the best balance when appropriate. And because Civ, Civ has one of the hardest jobs because we fit somewhere in the middle, you know, there's not gonna be a lot of easy answers for how we develop the AI. So the need for balance is compounded by the fact that we have many different types of players. There's players who come to the game looking for a challenge. There's players who want a, a sandbox experience. There's players who look for a narrative. You know, there's kind of talked to you about this before. These are the, the min-maxers, uh, the people who are just builders, the role players. Um, so for narrative players, you know, we, we put, we, we develop, we work on working on the personalities of the AI, that we have some that are like warmongers and some that, that are big traders and some that are, are friendly and some that like religion. They, we have them maintain memories, we have them fall for traps. You know, I think these are things that we, we write into the AI to make the game more interesting for people who role play the game. Um, 
but ultimately like we want we at the end of the day we want players to win the game or at least to understand why they lost now here's another question like when we're designing for the ai uh when you're designing the game itself as you know you're actually making the mechanics you'll face this question a lot um like you come up with some idea and then you'll have to think to yourself oh can the ai handle this like here's a, like uh i know with um with civ 3 we had this concept of the privateer which was a unit that uh you could build this uh pirate ship but it didn't have a nationality um and that was something that was really tricky for the ai to handle because like either well what if you know like probably ideally the, the ai would feel like hey this is this great unit because i can build tons of them go attack the human and they won't know it's me and they won't be able to like i can do it without declaring war and so on and so forth and that sounds super annoying so you know we didn't we didn't do that but it's it's it's, it's it is one of these things where like um should i should i pro should we add this feature to the game if we're not sure if the ai can handle it but at the same time, you do want to be conscious of the fact that as you're, as you're um, designing stuff, that you can make better choice. You can make design choices that where you're like, okay, I could do A or B. A might be something that works out better for the AI. It might be worthwhile if you're you're not quite sure which. You know, if both paths are viable, it might be better to choose the one that's <coughs> going to help out the AI. For example, is Civ four. I don't think I'm trying to remember if Civ three did this or not, but it's by by Civ four we'd switch from 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 having every unit every unit of Civ one was attached to a single city, which is a really bad idea. <laughs> it's kind of been forgotten, um, you know, because it, it got it got kind of like erased by the time of Civ four. But you could spit out a bunch of units from one city, and then that city was only not be able to build everything because it had to support everything. So we moved to kind of this global unit support system in Civ four, where you just paid for your units out of your global money pool. And it was a much, much better system. And, you know, the player, players had liked it more, but you know what, it was also a lot easier for the, the AI to handle. Having closed borders, people liked having, the, not having the AI wander through their, their territory. Um, when we, we added closed borders in Civ 3, but guess who else it was good for? And also really good for the AI um, because the human couldn't go and, you know, wander through the AI's territory and take advantage of them, you know, like literally, putting your units, you know, surround, you could surround their cities with your units because they had open borders, then they couldn't, you know, get out of them. Um, so, you know, all these other things, you know, enforced trees, treaties, uh, the sort of maintenance system, you know, these are things that, that when you design, you want to be at least conscious of how this is going to affect the AI. But again, you, you shouldn't, you probably shouldn't be doing anything where you're designing just for the AI. These, gen, these systems should be good for the human, but also conscious of how things work for the AI. So the um, the Civ four AI, uh, so the Civ AI, you know, was written. Another thing unusual about Civ is the AI was typically is written by the designer of the game. Uh, this I don't think is any true anymore. Um, but through Civ four, uh, it was it was always true, which which means it generally is a very cohesive AI. And I think it's important for a game like this where the performance of the AI is is very much sort of like I would say falls under the domain of game design. Right, is in that subjective category of like, okay, yes, the AI could do this, but do we want the AI to do this? So the whole AI was basically just 10 files, you know, something for game team player city unit. This is where all the AI code was, was associated. 25,000 lines of code. And this is what I call soft code decisions, um, which I'll get to in a bit. It was, this was, this for the whole Civ base, this is the percentage of it that was dedicated to AI for, for, for Civ 4. Um, Testing the AI because it, it because its performance is is not totally objective. You know, we would run um, we would run some automated tests every night. Remember when I worked on Civ four? Um, I, uh, I every night when I would leave work, I would have the AI do a like a non human session, like I basically run a game just against other AIs on my computer. Or when I come in, in the morning, you know, I would check how it did. Like on my computer, I would just open up the save file and be like, oh, okay, look, it's, uh, you know, this, 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 today the Romans conquered the whole world and so on and so forth. And you could, you could see what they did well and what they did poorly. And, uh, and beyond that, you see how far they get through the tech tree. And like, you know, over time, you know, I'd be trying to push it to get farther and farther each, each day um, to show that like, you know, the goal is like, okay, you know, by August, you know, I want to make sure that the AI is able to win the space race, for example. Um, so, but you can't really do it with traditional QA, which is, you know, just expensive, right? It's just people paying people to play the game, 
that's not a really great way to evaluate AI. So uh, we brought in, we had a um, private testing group for Civ4. This was pretty unusual back in 2004 uh, when, we, when we did this. Um, it was a year and a half closed beta before the game came out. We had like 100 users. We sent them bi-weekly patches and they would let us know what the AI was doing, how the AI was, how the AI was performing. So what we had is what I called soft-coded AI. There were no AI scripts, no enums. Um, what it means, so we got, our code was not brittle. It was less predictable. It, what, it means, what this means is the AI was unaware that the game was even about civilization or history, right? It didn't have any sort of set build orders or first build a warrior, then build a temple, then build a whatever, because it doesn't even know what a temple is. Uh, it just looks at the values of different things like, oh, this unit has this strength and this movement, this building does this happiness and this, this culture and this money, that's all it did. So for example, to show you what I mean, we didn't have something like this, where if, if this building is a temple, give it a value of 20. No, instead what we did is we would say, okay, if this building gives some happiness, well, how much angry population does the city have? Because the happiness is only going to, it's only valuable if the city even has angry population. So we're gonna assign some value to that. And then, hey, this, this building gives culture. Well, we value culture at this, this rate. So we're gonna give it this value. So this is great because modders can come along later and um, you know, they can get rid of temples and just add all of their own buildings and the game's still gonna know how to evaluate their the stuff they did. <coughs> and this leads to what I would call probabilistic uh, reasoning, which is that the game, uh, the AI is making decisions by assigning weights to various factors, uh, adjust those weights based on the current system, add some random noise, and then makes a decision. So that's how it will pick what's the next technology to, just to research or what's the next thing to build in a city. So for example, um, you know, here's, this is, this is from the function you know, in, in Civ 4 that decides how much value to give to a certain technology. So first off, it's like, oh, how, have I already spent time researching this technology? If so, great, because you, know, you, wanna, you wanna keep researching the same technologies so you'll actually finish them. Uh, okay, does this technology unlock irrigation? Okay, we'll give that some value. Um, but you can add things a little more um, sophisticated. So if this, if this technology gives open borders trading, well, okay, have we actually met anyone? Because if we haven't met anyone, then that doesn't give us any value. And if we have met someone, okay, how many coastal cities we have? Because the more city coastal cities we have, or do we have coastal cities? Because that makes it more likely we'll be able to connect to their trade network. And then finally, at the end, you take that value and then you add some random noise. And then that allows you to um, compare this technology with the, all, the, all the other ones you might be able to, to research. And that's, uh, that's it. So um, that was my you know, kind of more quick tour through uh, some of the issues involving with writing AI for, for SIP games. So now let's see if we can, we can open up for questions again. Yeah, let's try to see if, uh, I'll try again to see if I look for raised hands and try to call people in instead of taking it through chat. We'll see if that works. <coughs> um, so Vincent actually had a question. Uh, it was performance of fun AI could be measured by the retention rate of players who experience it, or is this not very true? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, that's. I mean, I mean, that that opens up a whole other rabbit hole of like, what what's the most important thing you're looking for? There never should be any one metric that's like you pursue above all ever others. But I mean, retention is a pretty good one, right? It just means how much do people like your game, or how much do people keep coming back to your game, right? So, um, it's uh. Um, when I was kind of thinking through a lot of these, these things, metrics were less of a thing. Um, so there wasn't really a good way to uh, uh, really, uh, we didn't have the type of tools to measure retention uh, back when I was working on, on SIM4. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it's true. Um. I actually do have a question as well uh, sure. from my end. So um, between all the 100 players, how did you actually get them to play the game for a year and a half? Like, it's it's quite a long time. <laughs> well, this these were all players who are our most dedicated, from our most dedicated fan communities. So back then, it was uh, there's a site called Apolitan, 
and uh, then and Symfonatics had just was just kind of getting to start up as well. Um, and so we had, uh, I had, at that point, I developed kind of a long-term relationship with a number of the players on those uh, forums. I played in games with them. Um, I, you know, got feedback from them on Civ 3. I'd been very open about the things we did right and wrong. Um, and, you know, a lot of their suggestions had gone into um, the patches for Civ 3. So we developed up a certain level of, of trust with that community. And... I was able to, I made a pitch to Fraxis to be like, hey, I think it would be really great if we had a private, some sort of private group so we could, because when Civ 3 shipped, we discovered there was a number of things wrong with the game, which is just what happens, has always happened, right? And it just seemed to me that like, we were doing all this development. I wish we could have found out these things a year before we shipped, right? So let's try to solve this problem. So the only way you could figure out how to do this back then in 2005 um, was to, or 2003, I guess, um, was to invite players into a private beta. We had, we'd actually physically mail them a disc um, and uh, I feel like, do we have to mail them? I can't imagine we had to mail them a disc for each update, but it was, no, I think we were somehow able to pull that off over the internet, but there was, it was not as easy today where you can just have, you know, like Steam betas that you just send around with keys or not. It was, it was, it was complicated and they all had to sign big legal documents and you know there's definitely people at the publishers who were who were not a big fan of this idea but it worked out super well so they played the game because um they were super into civ uh we had a private forum and we were active and open and engaged in it so they saw that they saw week after week that their suggestions and ideas were you know came through in the design because we would you know we would ship a new game every new update to them every two weeks which is really not that much different from the the cadence we still have with, with Old World. All right, cool, thank you. Uh, we do have uh, another question. Uh, do you want me to read them out or do you yeah, prefer sure. to? Read them? Okay. Sure. Um, so I have a question, but it's not design related, so feel free to ignore me. Is the internet legend about Gandhi's AI and Civ having a bug that led him to drop a lot of nukes true? Or is that just a legend? Um, so it's basically a legend. Um, Sid's kind of confirmed this uh, recently. Uh, he did like a, he did like a book, uh, where he talked about this some, and it's apparently it's kind of just a human perception thing where, um, because it's Gandhi, if they, they do this to you, it kind of stands out and it kind of just snowballed somehow. I kind of remember there's some other detail I'm missing, but I, I remember I interviewed him about that book. And I kind of brought up the Gandhi thing. And then he kind of like, he kind of, um, what's the right word? What's the right term for it? Um, he kind of fudged it a little bit, in my opinion, where I realized that like, it's possible that, you know, it's like, well, I don't think it's a bug, but of course anything is possible. So <laughs> I don't really know where things stand at this point, honestly. But at this point, it's officially, it's officially supposed to be, uh, a uh, an urban myth, um, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, it's never a good answer. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, actually, yeah. So they said no. It's great. Thank you. So wonderful. Um, great. Hello. Uh, I do have one other question as well, which is closer to like finding the fun. I would say. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned not too long ago that, um, uh, you know, when you're playing against an AI, you, you, sometimes you feel like it's actually a computer you're playing against. Whereas, you know, depending on the kind of game you're playing, it could feel like you're playing against an actual player. So um, the, the question I want to get to is how do you find the fun in terms of playing, like feeling like you're playing against a computer versus playing against, um, you know, an actual person on the other end of uh, the board? Right. Uh, sorry, can you ask that again? Okay. Uh, how do you make sure that the game feels like you're playing against someone and not something, which is an AI? Right. Well, um, so a lot of that actually is determined by stuff that's kind of outside of, of the actual like AI code. A lot of that starts to get into the, the presentation aspect of the game. Um, 
uh, you know the 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 art and the animation and uh even the sounds and um how the game frames itself i mean when if you're playing a you know if you're playing like a tower defense game right which is my go-to example the one thing that, that that kind of frees it up in the sense that like you don't you don't have any sense that you're playing against a person right it's not trying to try to solve this but if you are if you are playing a game where you want to feel like there's people in the game then you kind of you want to you need stuff like um a good good dialogue to come up you know you you need to have a variety of um you know like in an old world we try to get that out through like the, uh, the event system right where you know you can you know obviously you play the game a lot you're going to see stuff come up over and over again but you know at least for the the new players you may want them to give a sense that oh there's there's stuff there's stuff going on off off screen and you know sometimes i get a peek into this world you know crusader kings does this by just having this huge simulation where you have thousands of characters wandering around and doing all sorts of things um i know that uh ai developers sometimes talk about how um like in a, in a shooter or something what's really effective is just literally having the ai call out like grenade you know like if you you know like if you throw it at if you throw a grenade at them and you hear them literally yell grenade it, it, it doesn't actually even have to change their behavior at all it's just this like oh i did something and i see that like they're reacting to it in some in a you know in a human way so a lot of that is actually at the at the presentation layer in my opinion cool fantastic thank you um all right so do we have any more questions and it doesn't have to be about, about AI. We can have at this point you know, questions about anything somebody wants to bring up or so or whatever. All right, that's it. That's it. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right. Uh, Soren, fantastic talk. Thanks again. Uh, big fan. Loved, loved Offworld. Um, always listen to your podcast as well. Uh, I've noticed last couple of games, it's no big secret, I guess, that you've been trying to, it, it almost seems like you're like deconstructing um, what civilization used to be. Just picking holes at it, changing up mechanics and systems here and there. Uh, is that something you plan to continue uh, on your next game, perhaps? Um, perhaps. Uh, still trying to figure out what what we're we're going to do next. Although we're, we're going to be working on old world for for a long time, but I, I, I certainly am that type of designer. I think where you know I'm, I'm I'm looking at I'm looking at games as they are, games that are out there. Trying to figure out, okay, let's not take for granted that. These games should always work this way. How can we pull it apart? How can we make it different? What are what are parts we want to keep and what are parts we want to throw out? So um, that's certainly the way I, I approach games. Um, you know, I, I'm unlikely to make you know like I don't know, you know, something like Papers Please, where it's a real you know conceptual jump forward. Um, you know, I'm much more likely to make a game like Old World, where you know I'm you know radically you know, re recontextualizing and rearranging, you know, the pieces of, of a system that that's already kind of, you know, interesting in place, you know, it, but that's, I think, a, a place every designer needs to figure out where they, where they fit in, in the, in terms of game development, that what we're, what they're best at. Absolutely. Uh, if I could just follow that up with, with one more related question. Um, are there any other pillars to like the forex genre you would be thinking of uh, tinkering with or like eschewing or you know just playing around with? Uh, yeah, I mean, I you know it's kind of hard for me to answer that right now because uh, I mean we really did kind of go with it for old world like there really wasn't anything that we we didn't. That's know. true. <laughs> stone was unturned, you know. I, I, I'm sure there's sure there's something in there that's still. Uh, you know, I had actually had a good answer to this, but it's escaping me at the moment. Someone asked me uh, something in this in this ballpark before, but um, I mean, to me, I, I probably the last the last um, bastion or the last 
frontier or front or whatever is maybe the tiles themselves right um that's that's a huge one uh I, yeah I think, sounds about right i think it's um it's hard for me to know whether that even is something that should be changed or not, right? Because I think I, a lot of, I love tiles, right? Like, you know, so, so much of the work I do, it all revolves around like, okay, these units can be on this tile and the river means this and having to, you know, I've got more stuff on the tiles. Like I pulled stuff in the cities out into the tiles, right? Like you can right. stand on the temple, you can stand on, you know, on the pyramids that means something. Um, you know, I think all that stuff is great, but if you want the game to go maybe faster, like significantly faster, if you move to more, you know, you move to some sort of territorial system, you know, if I wanted to make a game that was actually about the history of the world, right? Like I bet, you know, I think, it, you know, like I think that at some point I'll have to, you'd have to think through like, okay, our, our tiles making it. So this is a game that'll always be just too, um, too clunky to last less than 20 plus hours, right? Awesome. Thanks for that. Cool. Uh, any, anyone else? All right, uh, I think we're good to go for now. Uh, Zorin, thank you so much for this talk. This was honestly absolutely wonderful. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, yes, we also have another workshop tomorrow. Uh, thank you for your time, <laughs> Zorin, today and then tomorrow. It's, it's always uh, a pleasure to have, uh, you know, someone like you give, give a talk. Uh, so everybody on YouTube, uh, thanks for joining in. Everybody here, uh, come in, same thing. Well, yeah. I guess we'll see you tomorrow. All right, great. Thanks for thanks for attending, everyone, and uh, look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow.